Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Tonight, in this exciting and inspiring ambiance, our six finalists, Roland Hirma, Guenever, Claviro Atmojo, Wouter Robers, Lindsay uit de Bolgaard, Hildo Bell, Bauke Steenhuizen, will compete in order to be one of the honored speakers at the TEDx Delft on the 7th of November. The winner of tonight will be part of the official program and get the chance to inspire thousands of TED enthusiasts in their six minute of fame on the TEDx stage. My name is Nikita Lier and I will be your host for this evening. Let me briefly show you the uh, program of the evening. Let me also introduce these to you. I would like to thank our main sponsor, Brunel. For those who do not know Brunel, <coughs> Brunel is a global provider of business services and specializes in flexible employment of professionals in engineering, IT, legal, finance, and oil and gas. At Brunel, ambition meets ambition. Of Brunel's cultural values, eagerness is probably the best word to describe Brunel's identity and ambition a value that matches TEDx spirit of innovation and ideas worth spreading. Brunel wants me to wish all the finalists best of luck with your talks. It is not by chance that we are here today at the Yes Delft Incubator, one of Europe's largest incubators. Yes Delft provides a solid base for startup companies who aspire to become tomorrow's leading firms. To build a bridge between students and these entrepreneurs, Yes Delft Students has been founded. Yes Delft Students encourages motivated students 
who wish to expand their horizons in the dynamic field of entrepreneurship. All the companies start with a good, innovative idea. That's why TEDx spirit of innovation and ideas worth spreading is a great fit to the Yes Delft students. We also have our founding partners, Yes Delft, <coughs> yes Delft students and studentenpreisvraag.nl, who worked closely together to give you this first TEDx Delft award. I would also like to thank Motif for the <coughs> workshops they provided during the workshop round and the additional coaching of our finalists. This is something they do with a lot of experience for years and which greatly helped the finalists to prepare for this final. I hope you agree on that. To capture the great moments of today and spread the word, we have two media sponsors, Stud and Nobiles, and we are very thankful for the support and we will be a great boost for the next, hopefully next editions of TEDx Delft. Okay. In order to be able to talk at this prestigious talk at the TEDx, TEDx Delft, this, tonight, this award tonight gives the finalists the opportunity to spread the ideas not in front just of you, of the audience, but also in front of our professional jury. Today our finalists will be judged by a, a panel of experts in technology, entertainment and design, led by the jury president, Jim Stolzer. Jim uh, Stolzer knows it's what it's like to be on the TED stage. His thesis about the digitization of happiness brought him on the stage of the TED University. He's the founder and licensee of TEDx in Amsterdam, and he is an active as an investor at the Founder Institute. <coughs> We're also very proud to announce that Carver Leinton is the technology expert in today's jury. He studied chemical engineering at Eindhoven University of Technology and went on to become a professor and a dean at TU Delft. And since 2010, he is director of Magnificus at the TU Delft. Supporting the jury from the entertainment field is Apple van Nispen. Welcome. He built one of the most modern libraries of the world here in Delft as the director of Stichting Doc Delft. You must be familiar with that. And in 2010, he became the new CEO of Sapien B, <coughs> being a foundation for a formation of the Dutch book. Last but not least is our design expert, Mette de Velde, bringing her unique view on sustainability to the table that she translated into Strawberry Earth, in which she founded in 2008. This is an uh, international blog for creative people who care about the environment. All said this, I think it's time to get started. Started with the final of the TEDx Delft Award. I wish you all the very, very best. Good luck. And I would like first on stage, Roland Herema. He represented Belgium in the European Union contest for the young scientists, if I'm correct. Yeah. And you were winner of the Catch of Start in 2008, organized by the ESO and EAAE, which is the European Sovereign Observatory and European Association for Astronomy Education. Okay. Best of luck. Did you know that the state of Georgia reserved over $100,000 to have this recording, minimal as it may be, spread to every single mother in the state of Georgia because the music would make their children intelligent? Students' IQ scores proved to rise to, as they listened to this very piano sonata from Mozart. And this was called the so-called Mozart effect. It woke people up and turned this 250-year-old music into the largest contribution of music to public health the world had ever seen. And this is when I personally began to be inspired by what I like to call the power of music. Now, I want to boldly claim that music is the purest art there is, because it is the only art not bound to the chains of time and space. It does not discriminate age, race or gender, 
and of all languages in the world, it is the only one commonly understood by everybody. Everybody? Yes, everybody. Every single one of us listens to music in the same way. For it is an incredibly human property, for example, to listen to music and recognize a rhythm. We are the only species that start tapping our feet when we hear a rhythm. And maybe we start da even dancing, and before you know, the music brings people together. Here's another one. Every single one of you is daily bothered by the so-called earworms. And I'm not talking about the insects. Earworms are little pieces of music, jingles if you like, that just keep on playing in your head and they can't get out of your mind. You know what I mean? There's, there's more you will recognize. Have you ever been on a funeral and you felt like crying when music started playing? Or another one, the world famous Tear of Maxima. She cried on her wedding because music was played from her home country. Now, I hope to have proven to you that music can do things to our body that we cannot control. And that's because music immediately affects our brain, the most mysterious organ we have. I have a little quote for you. If the brain was so simple we could understand it, we, again, would be so simple that we couldn't. Now, I want to prove this to you through a few examples that I find particularly intriguing. This is neurologist Dr. Oliver Sacks, and he's a very strong advocate of the healing properties of music. He wrote about some patients of his suffering from aph aphasia, which is a disorder that uh, disables you to speak language. This, those patients were literally unable to utter a word, but they could sing fluently, including the lyrics. <coughs> then again, there were examples of ALS and Parkinson patients, both with very severe nervous conditions. People unable to take a step were able to dance fluently. Or Alzheimer. Patients in different stages of the disease all responded to familiar music. Actually, in some extreme cases, they even re even some, some, some personal memories came back up as they listened to songs that they used to know. Now, that, that latter case proves that it's not just about classical music, although it does appear to be the genre that is most effective. Because you can analyze, for instance, water exposed to music, and it gives you mind-blowing results. If you expose water to music, and you freeze it, and you look at the ice crystals, you can get astonishing differences. On the left, you have uh, ice crystals exposed to metal music, and on the left, you have, um, on the right, you have music exposed to Mozart music. Now, this is just simple water, no more than that. But give it a thought that 70% of our bodies consist of such simple water. From this starting point, it's not at all that difficult to conclude that music actually biologically affects us. It makes us smarter and healthier. Now, unfortunately, we live in a country that wants to cut 200 million on culture. Now, I didn't want this talk to be political, but I do believe that if the government would spend just a tiny bit of money, of money in a handful of conservatory students, then why couldn't they make Mozart CD and make them have, uh, have, uh, have them make a recording and spread that recording in hospitals, in clinics, in kindergartens, in schools, in hospitals, in, in, in universities? Now that's investment in education and in healthcare. Is it going to happen? No. Because we still live in a country where people believe that music is a left-wing hobby, that it is reserved to the happy few and the cultural rich. Now, we must admit that the average age of visitors of the Concertgebouw may approach the may approach 100 even. Although there are also other examples, the yellow lounge parties, the yellow lounge parties, which are actually discos, in which people have di have DJs who mix classical music. It's immensely popular, and they're immediately sold out because it's fun and it's cool. Finishing off, there's one more thing I'd like to ask you: when you leave this room. Please do me a favor and spread the word. Have earworms. Have other people have earworms. And tell them about the power of music. Because music can make you smarter and healthier. And why not? Happier. Music can change your life. small children and they behave a lot better when they listen to classical music, but I don't know if that's a...
first thing is my compliments because you had a bad start. That's difficult. That technique, when it fails, it fails your start, fails your push, fails your want to go in. But what I a little uh, missed at your start was the fact that you had the bump to go. And music is something so general with us. You started with music. It was uh, you, you couldn't do anything about it because of techniques. But you did talk only about music. And I would have loved to see that there would be more to listen to. Just amazing uh, uh, music to listen to, with amazing um, uh, examples. My compliments for the way you, you, you talk, because I thought you really have done, I, I just want to know, did you exercise a lot on it or not? Yes? <laughs> yeah. yeah? <laughs> not that I came up yeah? the path. <laughs> no, but you really had, uh, you could see that you exercised perfectly Every word, every comma, every point, every, <coughs> everything. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody from the jury who wants to comment? Well? Hello, everybody. So, uh, like I was introduced, my name is Guinevere, and I want to talk to you about a new and revolutionary idea of spreading scientific knowledge. So, I'm a na nanophysicist. And in my field, results are going to lead to science fiction. With nanophysics, stuff like a quantum computer is going to be possible, which is a computer that can solve unsolvable problems super fast. Quantum encryption, which is by definition unbreakable. Or even quantum teleportation, you know, like in Star Trek. <laughs> However, all these things are really science fiction right now. They're not going to happen yet within the next 20 years. However, it is going to be possible with, with the results that are happening now in the lab. So, what's only, what's only presented here are the results. In experimental physics, you're going to, going to be surprised of how much time, money, and work is spent on the equipment. Like making the setup work, getting the missing components of your setup, and a lot of <coughs> Uh, time and money is invested in developing homemade research tools. So, for example, in the group I'm working, with Leo Kauenhoven, quantum transport group uh, in applied sciences, um, we have developed this electronics of, of, of um, our technician, our group, and this is really an essential element in the success that's happening in our group. So, right now, these tools should usually stay within the group, they're not shared. And this is actually something that should happen because maybe there's another scientist who could very effectively use this technique. So actually what's happening now is everybody everywhere in the world, people are reinventing the wheel. This is an enormous waste of resources. In this, I see an amazing opportunity. These tools should be shared. And to make this happen, I'm creating the Nano Toolbox together with Leo Kauenhoven. It's going to be an online, easy access, and non-profit platform to do just that. So we want to create an online community where scientists can find each other and share their tools in an easy way. It should be easy access. Everybody should be able to, to distribute their tools freely so they can sort of diffuse through the community. And lastly, it should be non-profit. The same way that scientific knowledge is shared, it should be open source. So that means that open source tools like software or clean room recipes or stuff that can be shared easily it can be distributed for free on the toolbox. But for example, tools that are like electronics like I just showed you, they will come with material costs, so they will have a price tag. They can still be shared non-profit. So the reason we're all doing this is to create a win-win situation for both the inventors and the users to create a synergy that's not been possible before, to bring science forward. So first of all, we'll save precious time and money. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. People can just buy their tools from other people they need to find the missing pieces of their setup. And on the other hand, developers will benefit from a large user group. When you're the only user of your tool, well, you won't probably write a documentation, will you? Well, if you'll have a large user group, it, the quality of your documentation is going to increase dramatically. Other than that, people will be able to provide feedback to increase the quality of your product and even give you tips and, and, and give you ideas for new special features you could add. And lastly, 
the platform will stimulate innovation. Actually, this online community we're creating, this scientific community, will comprise mostly of like <coughs> tech geeks and nerds who love to share their knowledge, who have a passion for their products. And by bringing them all together, they're going to share ideas, they're going to, to make new ideas happen. And already in the lab, people are going to think about, if I make this tool, if somebody else might need it, what could I add to make it better? So to summarize, I think these tools are worth spreading. And yeah, to, by erasing the barriers that, that exist between the research group right now, I want to create a synergy that has not been possible before, to push science forward, and to bring us a step closer to when science fiction becomes reality. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> find us on the nano toolbox this yeah. morning. <laughs> Wait a minute. My first question is, how large is the community that's going to share this tool? How many people are now involved in this type of research, mm -hmm. and what could grow out of it? So right now we're starting with the network we have in, in quantum transport, the group that I'm working with, yeah. and it comprises of the, the Kaplan mm -hmm. network, we have the Institutes of Nanoscience of the world, so four institutes, four large institutes, and with the international network that we have in the group, I think we can reach about 100 to 150 research groups. And close collaborations have already been done with about 20 people. With the, the electronics I just uh, talked about, there are already 20 different people in the groups. And do you have special people organizing this in order to make it a business between parentheses because it's some problems that you have? Do you mean special people? Well, is it a side job for you or do you have special uh, people uh, well, devoted I, to this? I'm right now working in the group as yeah. a, a research assistant. I'm also devoting half my time on making this happen. Okay, so, so you're especially devoted yeah. to this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Leo is also uh, one day a week yeah. Yeah. involved. And, and if I would ask, how much is in the toolbox right now? Um, I would say we have QT Lab, which yeah. is uh, it's like a, a piece of software for mm -hmm. measurements. Mm -hmm. We have the electronics that I just showed you. Mm -hmm. We have Valves Villers, uh, single photon detectors. And there's actually a new idea now with from the same guy who programmed QT Lab to make Archive Plus, which is like a, a, a networking website where you can share ideas about scientific papers, where you can like, comment in papers and, you know, and send, send them to other people. <coughs> I would say about four right now. About the three suggestions for science fiction, which one is the closest? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're actually, okay. I would say the quantum computer. Yeah. The, the papers that I just showed you, one of them is actually my name is on it. We, uh, we realized uh, a readout of the double quantum dot, so if we can expand that and not create you know, an array of bits. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Ethion does not exist anymore. We sold it, uh, which was good. The reason that we sold it is that actually with Ethion, with very limited resources, we did what a very large company could not. So they figured out the best thing to do is to get it in-house and, and just, just buy us. So this is, this is a good example of what I want to talk about because I think I've got something that is interesting to you to make your uh, business, your uh, organization, or your personal life, day-to-day -day life, more effective. Um, it all started when, with Epion, I was asked to make a research program, and this research program would be two years. Uh, we just wanted to know what we want to do in the next two years. And I had a real difficulty with this, because we were in the field of uh, electric vehicles, and not everything was really known on what was going on there. So, um, at that time, I had, at the same time, I had a, a life-changing experience. <coughs> I read a book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, uh, I read a particular book. This book is, is called The Goal. It's by Elia Goldhardt. Elia Goldhardt is a physicist who wrote a novel about economics. And uh, what he found out, this guy in the economic work, world as I hear, he's a legend. Because he found a classic failure in classic economics. There was a fundamental failure there. And the problem was, is that when you've got a company and you're building products, then at some point these products come into sort of a uh, stock. And when you've got the stock, then you've got to sell them. And this stock of products 
as they think that you add value to these products. They are, they're worth a lot. And in your classic economics, your, the books of your company, this is seen as an asset. He found out that that's fundamentally wrong. It's a liability because you put a lot of money into it and you have not sold it yet. You're even, you've got problems there. Yeah, it, it costs money because of interest you put in. Uh, you put um, investment there also uh, to keep it there and probably when you're selling it, you're selling your oldest products. So what he found out for this is that what a good way to, uh, to, to make your efficiency of your company better is to make uh, smaller batches. Normally you make large batches to, to decrease overhead cost. And he found out that if you make smaller batches, you've got actually a better uh, better economic uh, principle for your company. Now, I was in research. I read this book. I said, this is exactly the problem that I have. I've got research program of two years. After two years of a lot of investment, I've got my results. And in two years' time, maybe my market will not be there anymore. So what, uh, what I, the only thing that I had to do is to change this from economics into, um, into the, the world of where I was. And I found out that um, uh, that a lot of companies took this idea from Eli and Gopra to, to change their books, but they didn't change the rest of their philosophy. So, um, so this, uh, but it's, it's not one-to-one -one transferable. For um, uh, Eli says that, uh, Gopra says that um, when you, once you sell something, that's when you get return on your investment. And this is actually the goal of your, uh, of your, uh, of your organization, to get <coughs> income from sales. And for my research, I found that actually, when I've got a research program, that actually the point of sale, it's not really there. So yeah, I had to find something else there. And what I found is that actually, is that instead of selling your research, what you do is that you, that your research, the, usually it's some sort of a question which get an answer. This answer is actually used for something to create a positive effect. And in lots of research, um, I might think that, uh, that if you, uh, I'm not sure how many people did a NASA <coughs> thesis, but I'm astounded, uh, it, you might think that at least 50% or maybe even 80% of these NASA theses go onto a shelf. So um, uh, this is the problem that, that we have. If you, if you can really change this, you can, um, you can, make, uh, you can be, do research into the, the right things. And this is what we did, actually our two year research program, we just decided to make the one-day research program. And what happened is within two months, we found uh, that we actually had all the questions that we ever had, we had them answered. And people started calling us, hey, you know so much about this, uh, uh, about these batteries and about fast charging. Um, we think that you're the, uh, the, the expert company um, in, in Europe, so we want you to uh, to uh, we want you we want your charging stations we want to s we want your products and this this is what happened and this really created a um, a speed that we never thought would be possible with a normal way that you um, conduct your research business and this can can be transferred to other things but the the important thing is that you use these um, uh, you use these methods that were uh, made by Goldrod in the in the 80s and transferred it somehow to your uh, to your cause and this is what we did and I think that this is something that's actually worth spreading. <laughs> how you talked really naturally, like you're talking to in front of your friends and you're so excited about it. And I yeah, was I'm like, drunk. <laughs> 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 I was leaning forward more and more because you were like, yeah, so excited. So that was really nice. Um, but I understand that somehow this book changed your life completely and um, that meant so much to you and even you changed the time of uh, working space from two years to one day, I understand, which is <laughs> crazy. And maybe um, when you do it again, or you know, when you talk about this again, it would be nice to also take people on, onto that journey and that life-changing experience, maybe mm -hmm. into more uh, visual effects as well. I don't know. Maybe uh, 
Uh, I don't know what you saw when you went into that book, but I can imagine that. Oh, letters. So letters. Yeah. Well, maybe you could do something with letters. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But I was really yeah. entertained by your story. Was really, I'm really intrigued by books. So okay, I'm you should it. read it. It's, uh, well, for me, it was life changing. Not just the fact that I read the book. It's cool. Thank you, Matthew. Anybody else who wants to? Did it help you further on in your company? I mean, it helped you getting started quickly, but did it help you further on? Um, yes, it still helps us every day. And the reason is that, um, uh, is that, um, is that there's always some sort of a bottleneck in your, in your organization, which... <coughs> Everything that you have ever known and thought about has come into your mind through your senses. Without them, you wouldn't even know that you existed. Every sensory input mixes with your personality, and your memories to create feelings, happiness, anger, assurance, security, fear. But what's critical is how we manage those feelings, the decisions that we take, and the action of them, even the small ones, because I believe that the hundreds of micro decisions that we take every single day determine our future. I'm talking about how we will spend our time, where we will be, what we will say. I mean, it is up to us, isn't it? Our future is largely the result of what we've chosen to do. But instead of using the amazing resources around us, so many of us choose to swim in sensory comfort as a distraction from more meaningful priorities. Did you watch the tsunami coverage on TV in 2004, for example, and feel compelled to help to do something, to raise money, or, or send in clothing, something, but never really got round to it? Or did you ever really want to sort of go after something, chase a cha challenge or conquer an opportunity, but somehow it sort of passed you by? What exactly will we do instead? Let me start by comparing what life must have been like for us as cavemen with how we live in today's society. Back then we ate berries, we huddled round fires, we hunted down game. We had no idea why the sun went up or came down again. Now we have become masters of achieving sensory heaven. I mean, for example, if I go home and I'm a bit cold, then I can turn up and heat it. Or if I'm hungry, I just go to the supermarket. If, I, if I'm bored, I can flip on the TV. And if I want any information at all about planets or other suns coming up or coming down again, I can go online. All of this is a generalization, of course. I mean, I'm talking about those in privileged enough populations to be able to appreciate this. But for those of us who are, you could say that after all of those thousands of years, we've done a really great job of keeping ourselves comfortable and entertained. I mean, it's true, if an all-seeing alien dropped in on our planet today, they'd say, uh, well, considering your beginnings as squidgy little amoeba floating about in the sea, you've done a really great job. You are ingenious, you're inquisitive, you're adaptable, you're resourceful, you can do anything. That alien might also sit back and observe how well we've learned to rid ourselves of as much pain, struggle, and risk as possible, to the point where the fulfillment of our sensory wants and the avoidance of struggle has become an entrenched habit. And the only struggle that we'll be as busy with is in pursuing more sensory gratification. I mean, it's as if we're running on autopilot, despite the changing world and its needs, and our awareness of those needs, it seems that we are still setting out, primarily, to make ourselves feel good, spoiling ourselves with clothes, music, information, toys, cars, like our little caveman brains have become overstimulated. And it's like they've become blinded and hooked on more, 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 like an addiction. But we sort of uh, a bit sophisticated about how we uh, put that across so that we're socially acceptable and it sort of goes away. Well, so what, you might say? I mean, so what with uh, spoiling yourself, with enjoying yourself even? I mean, what's wrong with avoiding pain and struggle? I mean, this is human nature, right? Well, I think that if we avoid struggle, we avoid the realization of our potential. <coughs> and if we avoid struggle, we avoid the confrontation of reality. Struggle doesn't have to be a bad thing either. It can be about energy, discipline, passion, inspiration. So perhaps we spoil ourselves because we can, and it's easier than dealing with the difficulties around us. Perhaps we're just going through a phase in history, some people called it hedonism, which is a school of thought that believes that pleasure is the only intrinsic good. 
But the question is, is this what you want? Is this what we all want? You can be a hedonist, a Buddhist, a capitalist, a utilitarian, a librarian, whatever you want to be. But the trouble is, are you doing what you would really choose to do if you've got the opportunity to think clearly about it? So I'm not saying what the future should look like or that we should stop enjoying ourselves and stop having fun. I mean, all I'm saying is we don't have to carry on quite like this. So what can we do about it? Well, I think there's two main things we can do about it. One is that we can get our goals that are true to ourselves and our ideas. I mean, what do you want to achieve? What imprint do you want to make on the world? They can be small goals, you can have multiple goals. It can be part of your day job, it can be part of your hobbies. Just find out what inspires you. Seek out new thinking and opportunities. It doesn't matter if your goals change. I mean, they will, you're evolving, they will change. But start somewhere, go for it, step by step. We're all doing it all the time anyway. Some of us are very active on that scene. But then, make micro decisions in line with those goals. So I'm not talking about the big decisions, like where you might live or, or, or what job you might take, because I think the micro decisions lead us those, up to those conclusions anyway. I'm talking about those every minute actions and behaviours. We choose them, and they're all that count in the end. So I believe our philosophy for life, or our formula for life, if you like, shouldn't look so much like this, where sensory gratitude gratification, minus struggle and pain equals happiness, the prevalent view. But maybe a little more like this, where the fulfillment of our needs, plus purpose and the inevitable struggle that comes with that, and a bit of fun of course, brings us a little more real happiness. Thanks for listening. very strong case for the fact that we're, we're just cavemen in shoes, right? Mm -hmm. But what's the, what's the other scenario? Because you say well, some of us are doing this all the time. What is the alternative? Can you give some examples of the other way? Trying harder is what you say, is struggling more. Could you give some more examples? Um, yeah, so people can, um, you know, if you're an inventor, um, doing something that's uh, that's going to make a difference, or maybe doing something small to save the environment, or, or getting involved in some kind of cause that's going to help people, or is it about being the best parent you can be? So it's just try harder. Or, or focus, instead of becoming distracted by sensory gratification, focus on actually what it is that really inspires you, because I think we're hiding. Yeah. Well, you know, six minutes is way too short to, <laughs> to give it a talk. What was the most difficult decision that you had to make, which part did you have to kill that you actually wanted to bring across again? Um, I had a part in there about shopping. Oh, right. <laughs> and about consumerism. Okay. And about um, a book that's been written called um, uh, the, the Age of Destruction that's coming along in 2050, and how shopping today might look so different if there's a collapse of the social and economic environment. So it would go from shopping for jewellery to shopping for power generators. And I wanted to keep that in, but I couldn't. Yeah, I think meant to put that in the next time. Take 10 minutes. Can I ask you something as well? What was your personal reason for this subject? Well, partly I'm a victim of this myself, and I see that. Mm -hmm. um, I've got two young children as well, and what do you want to tell them? So I feel that, um... Were you a shopaholic? <laughs> <laughs> I went through a phase. No, I just felt that um, it's a message that's almost so ever-present and so obvious, but isn't really exposed to it. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hildo. I'm the mystery guest today, so she doesn't know that much about me. Oh. I'm going to tell you what I am doing to improve the world. First, let's go back five years ago. Five years ago, I was starting my study of aerospace engineering, and there was this course for which I wrote a few summaries. Now, my friends all wanted those summaries, but I made the micro decision to be lazy. <laughs> I didn't send them the files, I put them online, on aerostudents.com. Now fast forward again five years. 
Today, the Air Students website has several hundreds of files. We have a thousand visitors every day. And every few weeks, I get reactions from those visitors thanking me for their website. I want to mention a few of them. Get them here. Thank you for making my life easier. Reading your files is so much easier than listening to lectures all day. <laughs> this is from airline technology. <laughs> the second one is from Rome. I found your summaries very helpful. My time is spent much more effective reading them than reading books. My personal favorite comes from New Mexico. Great website. I was almost dropping out of mechanical engineering when I found your files. They pulled me through. Now wait a minute here. I was just trying to help my friends. I didn't intend to help people worldwide. But it did amaze me. It amazed me that I could just spend 40 hours on one file and help thousands of students across the world, not just this year, but the next year and the year after, and so on. What I found even more amazing was why this worked. I looked at those reactions. Some of them told me they preferred my files above lectures. It actually makes sense. Not everyone likes to learn by listening to someone. Some people like to learn but to read. Other people, they told me, they preferred my files above their books because they're more summarized. Makes sense too. Not everyone learns in the same pace. Every student is different. Now here's the problem. At about every university in the world, we use a one-size-fits-all model. We give the same lecture to every single student. And this does not work. It does not work. It wastes the time of students, and the people are dropping out because of it. Now, I'm a typical engineer. When I see a problem, I want to solve it. And I'm not going to go to universities and try to change their ways. I'm not going to go to the students to convince them to work harder. Heck, I'm an engineer. I don't have enough social skills for that. <laughs> I am going to look at what I can do myself, and I'm going to bring the Aero Students website to a whole new level. My idea is to build an interactive learning application. And it is not just a normal interactive application. We've got plenty of those. It is an application that adapts itself to every individual student. It does this in many ways. First of all, it varies the way in which it presents information. If you like to read, it gives you written text. If you like to listen, it gives you a spoken voice. If you're a visual learner, it gives you pictures, animations, whatever works best for you. Second. It varies the speed and density at which it gives information. If you're really clever, it gives you summarized information. If you're less clever, it gives you more detailed explanation. This also works on a detailed scale. If you don't understand a particular topic, just ask for more information. In this way, you always get information in the right density. <coughs> Thirdly, there are the exercises. I was buried in them in my university time. My application doesn't give the same exercises to all students. It keeps track of what things you master and what things you are struggling with. It gives you exercises based on your individual skill level. What I think is best about my application is that it tells you when you've mastered a certain topic. In that case, it tags it off from this huge list of things you still need to learn. By doing this, it encourages you to master every single part of the course. How different is that from our current educational culture, in which even a six is sufficient? This encourages people to really master an entire course. I do see a few frightened faces in the crowd. You're probably <laughs> teachers. Will this cost me my job? Don't worry, it won't. What this application will do is it will invert the classroom. Students don't go to class anymore to get a one-size-fits-all lecture. They can get a customized lecture wherever they want. Students go to the class to make homework. Okay, I know homework is outdated here, this term. But they go to class to make homework, and when they don't understand something, and even the teaching application cannot help them, there is a teacher. We can finally have individual quality time, one-on-one, -on -one, between students and teachers. Trust me, that is so much more satisfying than lectures. Still, I see a few skeptical faces. Will this system really work? Is it possible to develop it? Simple answer. Yes, it is. Got the plans all worked out. Technology is here. The students are ready for it. We just need to build it. Okay, it'll take me weeks, even months, to develop an application like this, even for a simple, single course. But it's not easy, but it is possible. When it is finished, we have free education to people around the world. It is high quality education, but it is free education adapted to every single student. 
that has never been done before. And I'm going to make it. Thank you for listening. Why should not everybody do what you do? Why should not everybody do what I do? Well, I mean, first of all, <coughs> you need to know education. I've developed a lot of educational material through my website. Not everyone can do that. You need to know how to develop an application that can span the world. I know, like, how to set up animations. Not everyone knows that. I mean... No, but I mean something else. Yes? What you did is you worked your way through the material by mm -hmm. selecting what you liked, what Pace you, what pace you liked, what, in, what interested you. Mm -hmm. So, based on the material that's available, why should not every student be able to pick out those things? Why should you make an application that helps the students to do what they should be able to do themselves? That is a good question. It is because information is not always available in every way. There were courses I took in which the only way to get the information was through the lectures. I'm a terrible listener. After two minutes, my attention is gone. I hated those courses. I want to fix things like this everywhere around the world. I mean, people in <coughs> Australia, they might be able to only read books. I want to give them education in their own way too, free of charge, in the way they like it. Okay. So in two, three years' time, will you be reforming education or will you be redefining aerospace? That is an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, I'm going to start by building aerospace courses, but developing this application for a course takes tremendous amounts of time. You need to explain things in 20 different ways, at least. So, in two or three years, I might have reformed aerospace engineering education around the world. Then, other fields might follow in decades to come. It's not going to be very fast, but it's going to come, definitely. May the force be with you, then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Consultants, try poetry. <laughs> the quasi-objective qualities of prose are overrated. They are over-serious and over-regulated. The queen is more spontaneous and Prozac-free than the formalities paralyzing executive summaries. <laughs> Save your mouth full of watertight prose for the appendices, please. Postscriptum, stop waterboarding readers who victim your dyslexia provoking literal overdose. If memos and reports should be concise, activate, resonate, steal hearts and renew our eyes, one wonders why instead they're often big fat files that fail to impress. So how can it be both so obvious and unheard of to try poetry? For conservative reasons, poems are labeled cryptic, unserious, and unsuited for the adults only industry of consulting. In fact, the opposite is true. Poets decrypt the most complex and disclose meaning not just for the adepts, but for a universal audience. I'll show this. Take the definition of love. In prose, love is an emotion of strong affection, the perfect <coughs> attachment, and it goes on and on and on to in the end conclude that this prose quote makes love unusually difficult to consistently be <laughs> Now, compare poetry. Love is like a window in your heart. It just is. But, as scientist slash consultant myself, except from some delirious moments, it never really occurred to me to versify what I conclude. Until I started teaching poetry. I, uh, I had a class, a, mi a minor consultancy, 30 ambitious, big-talking uh, students, who uh, my job was to unlock their creativity in writing, so I distributed some summaries and said, make a 160-character poem out of it, an SMS. Now, saying just that killed everybody's creativity. <laughs> and you know why? Uh, for crying out loud, these students said, these texts are unreadable, and they were. They were inaccessible, full of inscrutable language, Nobody uses, they were not at all short, they were four to five pages long, and it was the work of top-notch consultancies. It took my students 15 minutes to come up with 160, 
of plain language, swinging, pitching the same report, but then powerful, to the point, and heartfelt. And my, my students are no poet laureates. They uh, uh, were uh, no exception, but yet able to produce good enough poetry to see how form adds, con adds meaning to content, how rhythm guides readers in how to interpret, and how a catharsis can catch a message as a whole. They're great qualities. But I owe you some examples more, right? Some, uh, some that everybody knows. Here, here's the first. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, here's the first. Van Rompuy, speeching. I am delighted to have this opportunity. It goes on and on, please don't read it. <laughs> uh, my point is that it is not him, but his prose that does not excite, because his haikus shine like stars in the night. <laughs> Two. Sorry. <laughs> this is uh, about ocean acidification, big reports. It is probably something that worries the IPCC. But really, it takes Al Gore and a schoolboy's talent for poetry to really alarm me. Vaporous rise as fever settles on an acid sea. Neptune's bones dissolve. Three. Commissie Davis evaluated our support to invade Iraq. He wrote a meaty report uh, about international law and legitimacy, but without spilled blood and torn flesh. Now compare. Ramzi Nasser writes, well, J.P., how does it feel to lie and see it printed? How does it feel to sit at Herod's side and kill a hundred thousand children just for one king's will? Legitimate? Uh, Councillors and consultants. Let your rattling fingers on keyboards fall silent and linger. Take time to find words that tick, tickle and stick, tingle and twinkle, click. Stop stuffing dead letters and all that not matters in justified paragraphs piled up in paper packages. To advise, it is a business and an art. So write yourself a window in your heart. To let your readers see what is to say, not to hide away. If conventions say it must be prose, let it be. But learn from poetry how to convey. I'm at uh, faculty TPM, that's Technology Policy Management. That's not, that's not interest, just letters and, uh, <laughs> and a time. I also <laughs> teach poetry, but that yeah. was just a, a funny move. And uh, I teach, well, public administration, policy, designing multi-actor system, cross-cultural management, those yeah. kind of things at TPM. And how many of the new consultants you are teaching are using your poetry? Well, they're used in class. And, uh, well, Everybody has his own way to, to, uh, uh, to uh, excel. Uh, I'm not sure one time is enough. No, it has to be uh, uh, much more institutionalized into education to uh, let people remember uh, about the power poetry can have. And last, what's your favorite poem? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> my favorite poem uh, is a poem by Leo Vono. What? <laughs> <laughs> the few points on the circle new, they must be more, at least a few. For each of their two neighbors had one of their own, or so they said. Uh, they felt they were a whole creation. With some communication, they uh, they uh, they felt the source that kept them round must be faint and must be found. One point worked itself free and zigzagged across the inland sea. The others followed and roamed on till circle and center both were gone.
that uh, I would like to ask all the finalists to take place on this big red cross <laughs> as they did before in the evening applause um, and of course uh, before we uh, before I ask Jim uh, the jury president to uh, announce the winner um, I would like to uh, at a certain point in time we did feel like we were the jury of the Voice of Holland. <laughs> because each candidate spoke with his or her own voice. Some in high pace with much enthusiasm, others whispered or used Mozart to tell their story. At the end of our discussion, two presentations really stood out. Each of them could have easily gone to the next round and be part of TEDx Delft. So I think that we should give a big hand to all the candidates right now because our mission was clear however for the jury only one can be the winner so uh, we're not going to bore you with another summary of our heated discussion instead we'd like to say one thing and that is a summary more wise is poetry in disguise. Wow. 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 biggest impression uh, on all of us so are there any words in your head left or in your heart <laughs> probably which is pounding like wow <laughs> oh my god you want to say some words now don't search ideas but stay instead where they come from right in bed <laughs> stay now.